This podcast contains adult themes and graphic violence. Listener discretion is advised. Welcome to Beyond Contempt True Crime. I'm your host, Renee, and today we will conclude Richard Markovanitz. If you haven't already, go back and listen to episode 6 that cover part 1 of the story. Let's recap where we left off. Mark abducted Sophia Silva and the Lisk sisters right out in the open after their school day. He sexually assaulted and murdered them when he lived in Virginia. Police, friends, and family never suspected him. The families of the girls and the wider community of Spotsylvania never received answers or got a semblance of closure. You are listening to Episode 6, Richard Markovanitz, Part 2 of 2. In Spotsylvania, everything went quiet after the murders. One year after the Lisk sisters' abduction, the police had video cameras on their grave sites to see if the killer returned. They hid cop chase vehicles and were ready to roll into action at a moment's notice. Police officers hid in the woods, ready to jump out and capture the killer. They kept a close eye on Donald Dana Miller, who was a suspect in an attempted abduction of a 12-year-old girl. His rap sheet included the murder of his 13-year-old stepsister in the 1970s, for which he served prison time. In 1998, he had approached a group of children and talked with them. Donald grabbed a 12-year-old girl and forced her into his van. As he went around to the driver's side door, the girl jumped out and ran off. Donald pulled out a pellet gun and shot the girl in her torso. A good Samaritan saw this happen and took a run at the shooter. Donald fired again and hit the man on the head with a pellet. Later on, he shot another woman, and she reported him to police. This led to his capture. The Lisk Silva Task Force which police had formed after the murders, got a search warrant and took blood samples from Donald Dana Miller. It disappointed the task force when the testing was negative and they would have to continue their search for the killer. Another man, Melvin Hogan, volunteered himself for the suspects list by not offering to help the investigation when asked. And he was caught behaving inappropriately around a young girl. Melvin worked close to the Lisk home He was a carpet cleaner and drove a white van. If you remember from part one of the story, a white vehicle was seen driving past the Lisk home around the time the sisters disappeared. They asked Melvin to give a DNA sample. He was one of ten men who refused, which created feelings of suspicion within law enforcement. One day he knocked on a door looking for directions and made a 15-year-old girl feel very uneasy. Melvin left the residence and came back again. He asked to be invited inside the house to use the telephone. Melvin had complimented the girl and made inappropriate comments about her sexual experience. The phone rang, and that gave the girl an opportunity to close the door on the man. She called her father, and he raced home. Her dad blocked the man's car in the driveway so he could not escape, and he called 911. Police now had the authority to take a DNA sample from Melvin. The results showed that he was not Sophia, Kristen, or Katie's killer. It was now 1999, and tips slowed to a grinding halt. The community was feeling raw, vulnerable, and desperate. The Spotsylvania Sheriff held back an important piece of evidence since the disappearance of the Lisk sisters two years prior. At a news conference, he held up a replica of a Tweety Bird watch, the same watch that Kristen Lisk was wearing when her abductor took her. When they recovered her body, the watch was missing, and her killer had likely kept it as a trophy. Major Howard Smith, who played a large role in leading the search for Sophia Silva, attended a banquet at the Virginia Homicide Investigators Association. He didn't know it then, but things would change after meeting Charles Pickett, who was in charge of the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children. This organization would play an important role in solving this case. At this banquet, Smith also learned about the Amber Alert system that was just introduced in Texas, and he wanted to take these ideas back to his Spotsylvania community. Mark's divorce from Bonnie was final, and this freed up time in his life. He reconnected with his father, Joe, and they went into business together. Joe was driving cab and also worked for a place that designed business signs. Mark thought they could build a taxi company that worked only for area businesses, and he set up a computer with all the proper tracking software. Mark was an excellent salesman and sold the idea to local businesses. They did well quickly, and Joe had three taxis driving for him. During this time, 
Mark also improved on and invented a better piece of equipment that his employer, Walter Grinders, could use. His invention reduced air rates down to zero. Mark was enthusiastic, and he knew this machine would save his employer millions. His employer was less thrilled, so Mark quit his job. He formed a startup company with some of his co-workers and stole clients from Walter Grinders. Walter Grinders threatened to sue. His new startup did not work out because of the stress of the lawsuit, and he wasn't the best at taking care of financial or accounting aspects of his business. This resulted in Mark losing his home to foreclosure. In August 1999, Mark's mom Tess and sister Kristen visited him. They all went out for breakfast, and Mark asked their waitress out on a date. After Mark's family put in a good word for him, the woman accepted his offer. To protect her identity for safety reasons, they have never disclosed this woman's name in the media. For this story, we will call her Janet. Mark and Janet fell in love quickly. They visited Mark's sister Kristen in South Carolina for Thanksgiving that year. Janet was ready to leave Virginia for good. Mark was ready to leave after his business failed and he lost his home. The couple moved to South Carolina and moved in with Kristen until they could figure out more permanent living arrangements. Mark did not even tell his dad he was leaving the state. Joe Vonitz would have to run the taxi business by himself. Mark and Janet got married before Christmas. He took a new job working at a compressed air company. That spring, the couple moved out of Kristen's house and moved into an apartment. Lucky for Mark, the apartment staff no longer ran background checks because of a recent management change. If they would have run that background check, they would have seen Mark's record from 1987 for masturbating in front of a child, and his application would have been denied. It was now 2000, and Spotsylvania encountered another incident. Someone with Florida plates kidnapped an 11-year-old girl while she waited for the school bus. She eventually escaped and reported this information to police. There were inconsistencies in her story, and a parent who was watching his kid at the bus stop verified that she was never there at all. Police confirmed that the girl was lying. One year later, a 12-year-old girl experienced a legitimate scare when a man pulled up to her house after school and asked her to get in his car. She said no, and he drove away. In the county north of Spotsylvania, a 48-year-old Franklin Todd Ritten R. was working hard to abduct young girls. He tried to lure three young ladies into his truck, but when the girls saw that the map he pulled out was blank, they immediately moved away from his vehicle and memorized his license plate number. One night, three sisters were playing soccer. He grabbed the nine-year-old and drove off with her. Police were on to him immediately, so Franklin shoved the nine-year-old out of his truck and raced off. Later, he abandoned his truck and ran into the woods. There was an all-out manhunt for Franklin, with helicopters flying overhead and police dogs trying to track his location. Franklin had a cell phone and called his daughter to pick him up. Police stopped the girl when they realized her license plates were registered to the suspect. An officer put on the daughter's coat and slid into her car. Franklin came out to meet his daughter, but much to his surprise, was arrested. When they ran his DNA, it was negative for the Silva Lisk murders. They charged him with kidnapping and sex crimes. Yvonne Melbush was a Canadian vacationing in Virginia. She was athletic and had been biking on the hilly Skyline Drive Road that overlooked the Blue Ridge Mountains in Shenandoah National Park. As she pedaled her road bike, a man passed her in a truck. A while later, that same man turned around, and she noticed that his truck now had no license plates. He was angry and forced Yvonne off the road. The perpetrator threw a soda can at her while he screamed sexual profanities. She was now off her bike as a man grabbed at her chest. Yvonne threw her water bottle at his head and placed her bike between them. The fight she put up was enough for the man to jump back in his truck. Just as Yvonne thought the incident was over, the man was now trying to run her over. At a timely moment, another vehicle pulled up to the scene and heard the screaming. It was a park ranger who radioed in a description of the assailant and the vehicle. There was not any place in the middle of this national park for this man to escape, and the rangers easily picked him up. They uncovered disturbing items when they searched his vehicle. They found area maps, a body-sized tarp, nylon ropes, and nylon cables. The man's name was Daryl David Rice. 
Well, he had no criminal record. They fired him from his computer programming job for yelling sexual profanities at his coworkers and for being an aggressive person. Police took his DNA and ran it against the DNA from the Lisk Silva cases. It came back negative. They also ran his DNA in the Julie Marie Williams and Laura Winans case. This lesbian couple had gone camping with their dog Taj in the Shenandoah National Park on Memorial Day weekend in 1996. They never returned home after the weekend ended. Park rangers looked for them and found Taj wandering around a half a mile away from the ladies' campsite. They found both women gagged and bound with their throats cut. They saw Daryl on video footage entering the park the weekend that the women were murdered, but the DNA analysis did not match for this crime either, and it has remained unsolved. Around that time, Richard Markovanitz took bereavement leave from work because his grandmother died, but he did not attend the funeral. Forensic investigations have yet to rule him out. Janet Ivanitz was going on a trip with Mark's family. They were heading down to Orlando to vacation at Disney World, which excited Mark's seven-year-old nephew. Mark had been feeling stressed out again because his wife had been passing out, most likely because of a flare-up of her neurological condition, multiple sclerosis. It also worried him because his sister was leaving her husband. Mark didn't want his nephew left with his brother-in-law because he didn't trust him. Now that Mark had the apartment to himself, he dug out the large Rubbermaid container and placed it in the back of his mom's Firebird that he was using while she was away at Disney. He got in the car and started driving. Kara Robinson had stayed over at her best friend Heather's house. They were going to the lake that day, but Heather was supposed to water the flowers for her mom before they left. Since Heather needed to get into the shower, Kara offered to take care of the flowers. As Kara slowly waved the garden hose over the greenery in the front yard, a firebird drove past the house, which caught her gaze. She always wanted a firebird, but she was only 15, and it would be another year before she could get her driver's license. In that short amount of time, when Kara was lost in her thoughts, the firebird turned around and pulled into the driveway. Ivanitz pretended to have a binder full of pamphlets and asked her if her parents were home. When Kara said no, he pointed his gun at her under the binder, slid around to her side, and jammed his gun into her back. Kara thought about putting up a fight, but she was so small, she knew he could easily overpower her. Mark forced Kara into his car and told her to get into the container in the back seat. She complied. Kara was a savvy teenager and she knew that serious trouble was right in front of her. She knew that men kidnap 15-year-old girls for nefarious reasons. She tried to pay attention to all the turns the car was making, but it was difficult. About 10 minutes down the road, Ivanitz pulled over and snapped fuzzy handcuffs on Kara's wrist. He shoved paper towel in her mouth and strapped a ball gag to her head. She felt like she was suffocating. He finished securing Kara by tying her hands to her neck. Mark started driving again. He told Kara that if she made a noise, he would shoot her. Vonitz pulled into the parking lot, lifted the container out of the back seat of the car, and dragged her into his apartment. Heather stepped out of the shower and toweled off. She looked around the house and couldn't find her best friend anywhere. When Heather walked outside, she saw the garden hose laying on the ground with water rushing out of the nozzle. Her next-door neighbor said, Kara got into a car with a man who looked like her father. But Heather knew that Kara's father was out of town for work. She called her mom Cindy, who in turn called Kara's mom Deborah Robinson. Deborah jumped in her car and raced over to Cindy's house while Cindy dialed 911. Police arrived and interviewed Cindy and her neighbor who had seen Kara willingly get into a car with a man. Based on this information, police decided that Kara had run away. Deborah told them that her daughter was happy and she would not have just run away out of the blue. Heather said Kara had not told her anything about running away, and they had plans to spend the day at the lake. Plus, Kara's shoes and purse were still there. Police accused Heather of lying. They told Kara's mom to go home and wait. In the police report, they listed Kara as a runaway. Kara's father Ron raced home from his business trip. He turned his four-hour car trip into a three-hour drag race. Ron got on the phone with police and demanded they snap to attention and look for his daughter now. It racked Cindy and Heather with guilt. It was Cindy's job to protect the kids, 
and she hadn't been home to do that. It was Heather's job to water the flowers, and it should have been her abducted, not Kara. Cindy called a detective she had known. The detective assured her that Kara was entered into the National Crime Information Center database, and someone had already reported a tip that they had seen Kara. Cindy called the detective two more times just to get reassurance that Kara's abduction was entered into the database. Mark opened the lid, and Kara stood up. She saw birds, hamsters, guinea pigs, and fish. Mark's apartment was a cluttered, messy zoo. At this point, Kara decided that she would cooperate to keep herself alive. Ivanet's letter to his bedroom. He removed the gag and all the bindings. Kara braced herself for the sexual assault, which would surely be next. Instead, Mark took out a notebook and started his interview with Kara. What's your name? How old are you? Do you do drugs? Do you have a boyfriend? Are you a virgin? Ivanitz was creating a record for his collection. Next, he made her undress and attached her to the bed with a contraption that spread her legs open. He repeatedly raped her through that evening. Kara made sure not to fight or resist him. Ivanitz always had a gun or a knife nearby to reinforce his authority. He also told her that she was to address him as Daddy. Kara asked, Daddy, may I please have a drink of water? Mark allowed her to have a drink of water. During this ordeal, Mark made her take a shower. Kara took her own mental notes during this time. She noticed hairspray and tampons in the bathroom. Clearly, a woman lived with him. Ivanitz watched her shower and made her shave. After, Mark and Kara watched the news to see if they had reported her abduction. He said, Let's see if anyone misses you. There was nothing about it on TV. Kara offered to help Mark and swept the floor. She wanted to get a better look around and used this gesture to gain Mark's trust. He dropped his guard a little. Mark told Kara about himself, including that he'd been in the Navy. He then made her watch porn and assaulted her again. The gun was sitting on his lap. Kara did what he told her. Ivanitz had to make a call. He put the ball gag back on Kara and ordered her back into the container. He told her not to make any noise, and he left the room. She could not breathe and had a panic attack. She was making noise, which made Ivanitz angry. He came back in the room and made Kara take a Valium. After he finished his phone call, she asked Daddy to let her use the restroom. Kara went to the bathroom and had a breakdown. Then she washed the tears off her face because she would not allow him to see her fear. She was drained in every way that a human being could have been drained. When she returned, she thanked her daddy. They went to bed for the night, and he put on her restraints again. Kara was beat, and she couldn't fight the Valium, so she fell asleep. A while later, Kara woke up to the sound of snoring. He attached her cuffs to a C-clamp on the headboard. She worked her cuffs loose from the C-clamp and got her foot out of the restraint. Kara slowly eased off the bed. She grabbed her shorts and forced one of her hands out of the cuffs, which was painful. She threw on a shirt and headed to the living room. Mark had purposefully placed a bunch of stuff in front of the door. Kara slowly and quietly removed and moved items. One thing hit the ground and made a noise, so she shoved everything out of the way, opened up the door and ran out of the apartment complex. Mark woke up and realized that she had escaped. He would be in serious trouble, so he prepared to flee. A high school-aged boy was getting into a car with his uncle. They worked at his grandfather's construction business. A young woman ran directly at them and had a handcuff attached to one of her wrists. Kara asked them to take her to the police department, which they immediately did. She told them to remember the apartment she came from, since there were so many in the complex. When the investigator ran Kara's name through the NCIC database, he could find nothing about her. It turns out that no one ever put her in the database, even Cindy's detective friend, who lied to her about it. When the investigator called Kara's mom, he expected to talk to a woman who couldn't care less that her daughter was missing, since there was no report in the database. Much to his surprise, he found parents who were worried sick about their missing child. 
Kara gave the investigators every detail that happened in her 18-hour ordeal. Ron and Deborah Robinson met their daughter at the hospital where she had a rape exam. They were so happy to find her safe and alive. Eight patrol cars raced to the apartment of Richard Markovanitz. They went to the apartment's main office to confirm the tenant's name and apartment number. When police knocked on Mark's door, no one answered. He had already fled and contacted his sister for help. Police got Mark's picture from the South Carolina DOT, and Kara easily picked him out of a photo lineup. The sheriff contacted the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children to report Kara's incident, and he hoped to gain more information about Kara's abductor. A woman who was in charge of the Analysis and Support Division looked up Richard Markovanitz and all his previous residences. When she saw he had lived in Spotsylvania previously, she felt sick to his stomach. She knew the cases of Sophia Silva and the Lisk sisters well. The crimes were so strikingly similar that she matched up the dates and places Mark lived during those time frames. She immediately faxed this information to the captain at the Columbia, South Carolina Police Department. Mark was in hiding, but the FBI could monitor calls from Mark's cell phone. They knew when he made a call or had an incoming call, it would ping the nearest cell tower and they would have his general location within a one-mile radius. Authorities determined that Mark was communicating with his sister Kristen. They tracked Kristen down and ambushed her. When police explained to her why Mark was in trouble, she didn't believe them. She was in a deep denial. She thought the relationship must have been consensual, and the girl was crying rape. Kristen called her mom Tess, who was at Disney with her son and Mark's wife Janet. She begged her mother and told her they needed to come home right away. Her mom refused and demanded to know why. Kristen begrudgingly told her that Mark raped and kidnapped a girl at gunpoint. Tess refused to believe it. Her son would never do something like that. It wasn't true. Tess turned to Mark's wife and said, We have to go home, but Kristen doesn't want me to tell you why right now. They scheduled a flight for the next morning. Before they got on their plane to go home, Tess told Janet the whole story. She was also in disbelief. Her husband would never do all the things they accused him of doing. Everyone tried calling Mark at various points after intaking this new and shattering information, but no one could get through to him. He had his cell phone turned off to keep the police from closely tracking his movements. Once Tess and Janet landed in South Carolina, police scheduled interviews with them. Mark did eventually call his mom and wife, but it was brief. They exchanged only platitudes of love, and the call was short. Kristen finally admitted to authorities she had put her brother up at a hotel, and police immediately went into action. When they arrived at the Days Inn, Mark had departed hours earlier. He had called his youngest sister, Jennifer, and headed to Florida to meet up with her. On the phone with her, he admitted that he did what authorities said he did. He had done it over many years in a couple different states. Jennifer was supposed to meet her brother at IHOP, but after a conversation with him, she picked up the phone and dialed the FBI. Ivanitz arrived at the Pancake House, but that got thwarted when Mark spotted police, and that is when the car chase began. As Mark led police on a high-speed chase, he called his wife and left messages on her answering machine where he confessed that he had committed murder and he had been committing crimes for a long time. Mark ran over the police spike strips and blew the tires out on his vehicle. His car rolled to a stop. Mark had one hand out of the car to signal that he had surrendered, but his other hand was on the gun. Police ordered him out of the car, and with his free hand, he opened the door, but he sat motionless in the car. Instead of complying with the officer's commands, Mark raised the gun to his mouth. Police ordered him to drop the gun and get out of the car. They unleashed a police dog on Mark, and the young dog gripped his left leg in his teeth. The dog attempted to pull him from the car, but when that didn't work, the dog moved up Mark's body and sank his strong teeth into his arm. The dog could not get Mark out of the car. And now the gun sat between Mark's lips, with the barrel buried deep inside his mouth. The orders from police were growing louder and were more frenzied. The dog was biting him. The whole scene was chaotic. He had once told his friend Danny... If he were ever captured, he would eat a bullet. 
Mark held true to his promise and squeezed the trigger of the gun. In an instant, he was gone. The cops handcuffed him and the EMTs worked on him, but he was officially pronounced dead on the side of the road. FBI agents knocked on Jennifer's door. Mark's youngest sister felt a mixture of guilt and numbness when they gave her the news of her brother's suicide. She called her mom and wanted to be the person to deliver the sad news. When they called Joe Vonitz, he had not even known that his son had been on the run from the law during the last few days. The news was jarring. Please consider charging Kristen since she helped Mark escape. But they let it go. Kara heard the news that her abductor committed suicide. She felt cheated. She wanted this to go to trial. She wanted him to sit across from her in the courtroom and look her in the eye. She wanted him to know that choosing to take her that day was a big mistake. She wanted him to know that thinking that she was weak was the biggest mistake of his life. Police were searching Mark's apartment. It was a mess and full of piles of paper, boxes, CDs, magazines, cups, animals in cages, cigarette butts, and laundry. There were bottles of medicine with MS medications for Janet and a bottle of Viagra that belonged to Mark. From the Viagra, police speculated that they didn't find semen on some of the victims because of sexual dysfunction. Janet confirmed Mark had issues with impotence. The bedroom dresser had little room for clothes and instead held porn magazines, information on bondage, S&M, shaving, and sex with children, 300-plus porn videos, and sex toys of all kinds. Dildos, collars, leashes, handcuffs, clamps, lube, and cock rings. In Mark's footlocker, they found newspaper clippings from a Fredericksburg paper that talked about the Lisk sisters' disappearance. There were directions to the Lisk family's home. There were also directions to Alicia Showalter Reynolds' home. She was a 25-year-old woman who had gone missing on March 2, 1996, and her abandoned car was found on Route 29, near Culpeper County. Her remains were found two months later, about 15 miles from her car. Investigators could never link Mark to her death. Police determined that there were many other girls that Mark had been stalking. He had notes on 12- and 13-year-old girls from both Virginia and South Carolina. He had directions to their homes, and notes on their physical descriptions, comings and goings, and personal habits. Police also found a pink bathroom rug, which they later verified matched the fibers found on Katie Lisk. He never allowed Janet Avonitz access to that footlocker. Mark kept a padlock on it and told her she was never to touch it. Police found many pairs of small bras and panties, none of which belonged to Janet. Police took 200 pieces of evidence from the apartment for analysis. Later on, when Janet went to turn in her keys into the apartment's main office, she left personal items behind, most notably the bed that her husband raped Kara Robinson on. They performed the autopsy on Mark, and among some other health issues, they found he had an active hepatitis infection. Mark's family had a small funeral for him and opted to cremate his remains. They feared that angry people would trash a gravestone. The interviews with Janet Ivanitz continued. She was still very much in love with her husband and did not want to talk with investigators. She even said she would have committed suicide with him and has forgiven him for anything he has done. She also admitted that Mark shaved her pubic hair. Police interviewed Mark's neighbors back in Virginia. They told Mark's old next-door neighbor, Keith, about what happened in South Carolina and that Mark may have killed Sophia Silva and the Lisk sisters. It shocked Keith, but he did not doubt what the officers were telling him. They wanted to know where Mark's ex-wife, Bonnie, was. Law enforcement feared for her safety. All Keith knew was Bonnie met someone on the internet and moved to California to be with him. Some interviews conducted were with women who knew Mark and said they found him to be creepy. They tried to avoid him, but at the time could not really put their finger on why. They notified the Silva and Lisk families about what was going on with the case. Ron Lisk did not want intermittent updates because it was too painful. He only wanted police to contact him once they concluded the investigation. This news was causing a stir in Spotsylvania. The local newspaper's website was getting a significant amount of views because the community was interested in all the breaking news on the story. The Spotsylvania police took a lot of criticism why Mark's conviction in Florida for masturbating in front of a child never put him on their radar. Based on laws at the time, 
Mark's Florida conviction did not require him to register as a sex offender when he moved to Virginia. Investigators looked at various cases of young girls killed in Florida, South Carolina, Virginia, Illinois, California, and Maine, but Mark was eliminated either by DNA analysis or by tightly tracking the timelines of his movement to each residence. They reopened a case where a man locked an 11-year-old in the bathroom while he raped the 13-year-old sister. The DNA analysis was positive for Ivanitz. America's Most Wanted featured the Silva and Lisk murders again. They also had an interview with Kara Robinson. She wanted to help other victims by sharing what she had been through. Major Howard Smith of Spotsylvania let the community know that the investigation was complete, and Richard Mark Ivanitz was responsible for the deaths of Sophia Silva and Katie and Kristen Lisk. They called a news conference. The Lisk and Silva families were in attendance and huddled in the same area for emotional support. The sheriff stepped up to the microphone and talked about how, five years and 11 months prior, Spotsylvania had suffered when the horrible crimes first began. The offender was a serial killer, driven by strong sexual obsessions. And the most difficult crimes to solve are those committed by these types of psychopaths. They are intelligent and often aren't suspected because they appear outwardly normal. They go to great lengths to not leave forensic evidence. These factors were present in all the murders. Some compelling evidence in this case was the fingerprints and the palm print that belonged to Kristen Lisk that were found on the inside of Mark's trunk years after the murder. Hair that was found on Kristen and Katie Lisk's clothing matched Ivanitz. One hair found on the rope used to tie up Sophia also matched Ivanitz. There was carpet fiber evidence that linked the victims to Mark's home in Spotsylvania, his apartment in South Carolina, and his car. All the girls had fibers from the fuzzy handcuffs which were forced on them. Tears streamed down the sheriff's face as he offered condolences to the Silva and Lisk families. Ron Lisk stepped up to the microphone and said they were robbed of their children, and the community was robbed of their trust in their fellow man. He was grateful for Kara Robinson's bravery in escaping that awful situation, and the Lisk family was grateful that Ivanitz committed suicide, so they won't have to endure a long criminal trial. Phyllis Silva expressed her gratitude to everyone who helped in solving the case and thanked the public. In a graceful move, she addressed the Richard Mark Ivanitz family by saying that this was also a difficult time for them because they, too, lost a loved one, and they can find peace with God. There were few dry eyes by the end of the press conference. When the sheriff returned to the privacy of his office, he said, I hope that SOB is burning in hell. There had been a $150,000 reward for information that led to the capture of the killer. They gave this money to Kara Robinson. They threw a big ceremony for her and her family in Virginia. Many of the officers from South Carolina attended, and they brought the police dog at Kara's request. Kara was making plans for a future, and she thought she was meant to be an ER doctor. She had a strong desire to help people and wanted to serve her community. Epilogue Ron and Patty Lisk adopted two orphans from Romania. They were not replacements for the children they lost, but considered them additions to the family because Katie and Kristen still live within their hearts. The Ivanitz family fractured in the aftermath of Mark's suicide. Kristen no longer talks with her mother. His other sister Jennifer and mother Tess went to therapy. Jennifer no longer talks with her father Joe because she feels it's not healthy. Joe feels sadness about the situation. It upset many members of his family that they saw no signs or clues that could have prevented this. Kara Robinson and Sheriff Leon Lott of Richland County had forged a friendship out of this tragedy. He invited Kara to work at the Sheriff's Department, and during her college years, she did administrative work there. Her plans of being an ER doctor had changed. She was going to college to become a teacher. Her job at the Sheriff's Department caused Kara to change directions again when she merged teaching with police work and became a school resource officer. She believes that Mark Richard Ivanitz committed other crimes in those five years between him killing Sofia Silva and his abducting her. Kara says she is not a victim, and he took nothing from her. What happened to her doesn't define who she is, and she refuses to give Ivanitz that kind of power over her. 
Kara is married and has taken time off from her job to raise her two small kids. Thank you so much for joining me for this episode of Beyond Contempt. I hope you enjoyed this short series on Richard Mark Evonitz. You can really go down a wormhole researching this case when you consider that he is a potential suspect in the Route 29 stalker murders. Reach out to me on social media and let me know what you thought of the story. Releasing multi-part episodes two weeks apart is probably a little too long to wait. Let me know what you would prefer. Please visit beyondcontemptpodcast.com for links to the sources and music used in this episode. There are many ways to support the show that are listed on the website. The feature podcast for this week is the Mens Rea podcast. It's a narrative-style show that discusses true crime cases in Ireland and the UK, and I really enjoy it. Mens Rea is the legal principle of criminal intent. It means literally the guilty mind. Join me, Sinead, every fortnight to discuss Ireland and the UK's most heinous crimes and the court cases that followed. Do you want to know more about a kink killing in Dublin in 2012? Or serial killers in Scotland? Whatever your guilty pleasure, you'll find it and all the details with me. Find Mens Rea wherever you get your podcasts.